After six years, Mayor Anise Parker's three-term legacy will soon be coming to an end. On November 3rd, voters will take to the polls to cast their ballot for a new mayor of Houston. The winner will serve as the chief executive of the fourth largest city in the United States. Responsibilities include signing local legislation into law, proposing the budget, and overseeing the Bayou City's day-to-day -day operations. This week concludes our chats with the candidates vying for your vote as Houston's new mayor. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome mayoral candidates Ben Hall, Marty McVeigh, Sylvester Turner, and Bill King. And leading our discussion are hosts David Jones and Gary Polland. It's the Halloween edition of Red Lights. <laughs> 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 we have four treats, yeah. right? Here. <laughs> 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 and, 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 you, and, you, and hopefully you'll be the ghost. <laughs> uh, so, so guys, um, everybody is going to be spending money uh, in order to improve our infrastructure. You know, we, we, we have things we have to do in the city. But here's a different wrinkle to the spending of money, and that is what I would call crony capitalism. We've got a drainage fee, although well, there may be some doubts about that. Uh, it took care of the engineers. Uh, lawyers are, you know, on the payroll, private lawyers on the payroll, collecting delinquent taxes and fines, and now we've got bond council, affirmative action things. Is city government being run ethically, and what can we do to address those non-transparent issues that I just raised, and especially as they influence campaign uh, financing? Anybody? Sure, I, I'll take a stab at that. Let me say no, uh, city government is not operating transparently. We do have these pay-to-play policies and practices at City Hall, and I think it's wrong, it's shameful. And as a result, one of the things uh, that I've tried to campaign on is, is to make sure that we have a mayor who has integrity, who has not participated in these under-the-table uh, transactions with the city, and someone who will set up a standard for mor moral government in the city of Houston. So I, it, it takes a mayor who's going to get in and make those priorities as opposed to just simply giving lip service well, to it. Well, Bill King, to be fair, uh, somebody's going to do the job. We issue bonds. There's going to be bond council. If we're going to buy land, there's going to be title insurance. Uh, is this as serious a problem as Ben has suggested? Uh, I, I think there's some issues, especially around the towers, that need to be addressed. But uh, these are costs. I mean, projects have to be engineered before you can build them. Uh, we just got to make sure that, that everybody's got a fair shot at the work, and we've got to make sure that the fees are reasonable, and we've got to make sure that there's transparency. There's nothing like sunlight as a disinfectant when it comes to government spending. Uh, Sylvester, I, 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 I don't want to suggest it, but I, I thought that Ben was had mentioned that you had gotten fees before, but uh, for services rendered, uh, and I think you did title work for the for some entity, some government entity, uh, through a title company you're affiliated with. Uh, that, with those that I, that I own. You own, okay. Well, yeah, you are affiliated with it. Uh, so I guess the first question is, was uh, was your fees disclosed? Was it out there for anyone to see? Absolutely. Okay. No, and, no one has ever questioned the work that we have performed. So it was done, it was done appropriately? Oh, not only appropriately, with the greatest degree of excellence. Okay, and, 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 your fee, uh, and the fee charge was fair? This fee is just regulated by the state of Texas. We can talk about title business. It's just like uh, Stewart Title or Commonwealth of Chicago. Uh, and quite frankly, that only represents a small portion of what uh, my businesses do. We've been in business for 20 years, the title business. Uh, the law firm business has been in business for 32 years. And, um, and I'm proud to say that. So, uh, and most, most of the business has been with the private sector. But going back to the original question, I think it's always important to operate with the greatest degree of, of uh, transparency, um, the greatest degree of integrity. Uh, whether you're dealing with the city, whether you're dealing with the county, school board, whether you're dealing with the state, I think that's always important. Front, fr the front page, McVeigh, uh, Marty McVeigh, of the Houston Chronicle today was very disturbing. And I don't know whether or not this should have been a category for the hero ordinance or whether this is a Houston Housing Authority policy decision that has to be made. But there are tens of thousands of Houstonians who cannot get into living space because of 15 and 20 year old felony convictions. Felons are being forced to live with one another, and they just shut down an apartment project. Why? Why should we be discriminating or allow uh, uh, rental uh, people, uh, realtors, to discriminate on that basis when we have so many people? I mean, we, we had a punitive justice system that has just eliminated a lot of people. Right, and I, I think that this is a, a fundamental problem across the city. 
Uh, the city is using uh, HUD money, for example, for pretty much everything else except for HUD. We have a growing population. We have a, uh, a booming senior uh, class that, you know, we've got to look at housing. This is a serious problem, and we, we need to look for solutions that, that bridge um, you know, housing issues and bring them into the to the 21st century. We can't turn our back on the people that need us the most. And we need to make sure that we have an effective leader that is, you know, taking responsibility on getting people back on the right track. And that's well, what I'm interested in. There was a follow-up question to Sylvester because he's been in the legislature, was in the legislature for 26 years? 26 years. 26 years. Okay, so Sylvester, David has complained that people who have records from 15 to 20 years ago are not allowed to get housing in Houston. But is really the bigger problem, what, what's going on in Austin, that we have basically a generation of, of young black men, now older black men, that had picked up criminal cases when they were young and then stay out of trouble for 15 or 20 years. Why don't we have a mechanism so they can clean up their record? Well, I think we, we have taken steps to do that, but specifically to address that population that's returning to Houston Harris County. We have 13 to 15,000 that are coming every year. In this past legislative session as vice chair of appropriation, uh, I set aside a million dollars uh, for Dallas and a million dollars for Houston for uh, a pilot reentry program, specifically as a flow through uh, to address two problems when, as it relates to people who are coming out of our system, housing and employment. And that million dollars is to set up uh, programs with faith-based organizations, nonprofit, the private sector, to help in reentry. House Bill 1711, uh, which I passed a few sessions ago, provides people with the, um, their, let's say, their driver's license, identification, uh, setting up reentry programs across the state. Because we recognize it's not only benefiting the people who are coming out of the system, but it's also keeping the communities where they're returning safe. Okay, and that's critically let me, important. Then, let, let me see if I can refocus the answer to the question that you asked, and that is whether or not we should do away with the box. Um, after a person has faithfully served their time. I think that that needs to be revisited in Austin. I do think that once a person has paid their debt to society, uh, that they should not continue to be laboring under that, um, that penalty. Having said that, there are certain crimes, however, I think that should linger uh, for the lifetime of an individual, but not all crimes. So I would support legislation that would ban the box where a person has actually in the boxes where you have to check off whether you have a prior a felony conviction uh, for certain types of crimes. And I think that that is something that can be treated in Austin as well as here in Houston. And Marty, shouldn't that also, right. should that also include people that have, have stayed out of trouble for X number of years, shouldn't they be able to find a way that there's no disclosure? Because I mean, we've got some of that, but not enough. And so what happens is described when they apply for housing, the landlords say, hey, you got a prior felony 20 years ago, we're not interested. You right. can't live here. And as David pointed out, that is a serious problem that we need, need to address. Well, that goes back to your, to your first question, and it, it's really about leadership. Until we have a mayor that's, that's willing to come in and modernize our city government, tear down what it currently exists and rebuild it based on 2015 standards and being a modern city, then we're going to continue to have problems like this. We can't allow uh, people in our city to fall through the cracks anymore. We Bill, need to make I'm sure sorry. That, sorry. that the priorities of the mayor should be, and I've run my campaign based on this, is that protect Houstonians and protect the interests of Houstonians. And that means we, we've got to tear down government and rebuild it. Front page story again, uh, uh, Bill King, was the Chad Holly. Uh, case where a young man, 15 year old, stomped on by Houston police officers. Uh, McClellan, the chief, reported that incident along with others to the Department of Justice for review. The judge said, you know, that HPD's excessive force policy is satisfying to him, and Mr. Holly lost his case against the city uh, this week, and that the training of officers, Houston police officers, is adequate for high stress uh, circumstances. Uh, are you satisfied? This is this is not going to be the last black kid that gets kicked around by cops, and you're certainly not the first. Are you satisfied with the performance of HPD in these in these relationships, community relationships? Well, look, certainly what happened in that case is not appropriate, not acceptable, and you had officers fired as a result of that, which indicates to me that the process is working. Listen, I know this federal judge very well, and he is a deliberate, thoughtful person. And if he concluded that the city of Houston's training programs are adequate, the procedures are, I'd be inclined to believe him. 
Yeah, I, I don't know, David. You, you uh, used to represent the young I man. I did. I represented Chad Harley. <laughs> and why did, you, why did you quit his case? Because he persisted in breaking into people's houses, and I, 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 I just don't represent that kind of individual. Uh, but I did think that the force uh, applied was excessive. But what's the understory of that is that Chad Harley's lawyers settled with the individual officers. So the remaining question only for the judge was whether or not the city of Houston had a policy that actually resulted and was a moving force for this beating and it, and the city does not and as a result I do think that Ewing Warline who is the federal judge made the right call on that case. So let's move on let's talk about debt and tied to that is our pension crisis. Uh, estimates are that we are in debt 3.1 billion if you assume that the pensions are going to grow by eight and a half percent a year which I think is fantasy land in the present investment climate you may disagree <coughs> If it's not, if you drop it down to seven, our debt for our pensions is now almost five billion dollars, and of course, uh, it's going to basically swallow the entire budget of the city if we don't get a get a plan going and do something. So I guess we'll start with you, Bill. You have a plan to deal with this crisis? Yeah. First of all, the number is really more like four billion dollars, not three billion, for a number of reasons we could talk about. But uh, look, we need to do what private industry did 20 or 30 years ago. We need to go to find contribution plans. I'm not in favor of changing the benefits for uh, employees that are already working for us. They've given us their service. We've made a deal. And this is Texas. A deal's a deal. But to continue to make those promises to new employees is irresponsible. It's irresponsible to taxpayers, to the retirees. It's irresponsible to young people coming to work for us because the truth is we'll never be able to afford those benefits uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road, especially when you're assuming an 8.5% rate of return. That's just not realistic. Okay, so, so what do we do about the $4 billion already in the hole? Well, that's that's the, not the future people. Right. That's the people that are already... So that's, that's, that's the legacy cost. And look, you've got two choices. You can either figure out a way to pay that off over a period of time or you can say we're going to renege on the promises we made to the employees. I'm not in favor of the latter. I think we've got to figure out how to pay that off over a period of time. You know, look, private industry did this 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, they offered cash discounts. They refinanced. They pushed it off uh, in the future. As long as our economy stays great, we can afford a $4 billion hit. What we cannot afford is to continue digging this hole deeper in the future. What are we going to do about the 8.5% uh, assumed uh, return? Is that, or is that tied to local control? Well, the 8.5% return is just not realistic. It just means that the number is really bigger than $4 billion. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Turner, um, the suspicion is that because the fire and police union endorsements came so early, and never before in Houston history did they go so early as they did for you, uh, that it, uh, the suspicion that Mr. Bedford has is that you killed the Murphy bi bill that would have been a pension reform bill, and thus solicited and won uh, these two critical endorsements. Does that mean you're going to be handicapped in dealing with uh, the pension obligation problems? Well, I think the assumption is totally bogus. I mean, why couldn't, why couldn't people simply have endorsed me because they thought I was the best person? They may very well have. And I think that's what they did. You can tell that to Mr. Bedencourt. <laughs> <laughs> He's not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's, well, let's, well, you know, let's get him, let, him, let him finish his well, thought follow-up. Well, the, yeah. the reality is, is that uh, you have an aging labor force with the city of Houston 10 years ago. Uh, for municipal employees, for every retiree, you had three active employees. Now the ratio is one to one. That invariably will drive up your costs on the back end. The same thing with police and fire. The ratio is much, much smaller. Fewer active employees to retirees. Uh, you have to reduce the annual obligated payments. You have to start paying down on the unfunded liability. Uh, but I would say to you that you're not going to get that done until you engage in comprehensive finance reform for the city of Houston. You cannot balance the city's books on the backs of working men and working women, and I stand firmly by that. You still have a debt service that's going to spike in 2018. Uh, you have the TERS that take $130 million from the general fund every single year. You have a revenue cap that's in place that, does, that is not imposed on the county, and the county does not want it. The state of Texas, under the most conservative leadership, does not have the same revenue cap as what the city of Houston has. And you would repeal the revenue cap? I would modify it in one or two ways, either to pay for law enforcement. We need 540 additional police officers over a five-year period, cause, um, and I would modify it, or to pay down on the debt. The reality is, is that you, if, as long as we're only talking about pension reform and we refuse to talk about uh, comprehensive finance reform, you're trying to pick winners and losers, and you end up getting nothing. Uh, I, I, and a follow-up question, and we'll move down the, the row. Sure. Uh, you're the only major candidate who's refused to take the pledge to push for local control of our pensions in Austin. 
Is well, that true? Uh, or well, did you change your mind? No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not signing that. I've been in the legislature for 26 years. That's, that is rhetorical gangsmanship, political ship. That is not about getting anything substantively done. And I refuse to play those type of games. The reality well, is since, the reality is since 1993, there has never been a change to the local system without the locals, the mayor, the city council, and the local stakeholders bringing their proposed changes to Austin and Austin ratifying That's true, changes. and the concern, and, and that goes back to what, what David said, the concern, Sylvester, is because of the support you have, you, as mayor, you will not be able to make that well, decision. I think, well, but you, but you can't. Well, if that's the case, you have police, fire, municipal workers. You have um, you have the Houston Chronicle. You have the Jewish Herald Voice. All of them are supporting me. Why did I? Why did they come on board? They don't care about pensions, Marty. How about you? You support local control. Why did you? Why did you take the play? Well, I, I do support local control. I, I think it's unreasonable for uh, an employer can you tell not what that means? being able to. You know, we're that's we're able question. to uh, negotiate with our employees. I mean, that that's what it comes down to. We have to have a global settlement here. And we have to bond this debt, move forward, keep the old employees in, a, in the old pension system, get a new pension system that is sustainable. Because the one that was was pinned uh, years ago, it was it was dead on arrival. It was never sustainable. So we have to move forward. At the same time, we need local control. Let me finish. <laughs> and we need to ask the governor for a special session on this to Bill have King a global says, settlement. Mr. Hall, Bill King says that we need a charter amendment. To change it, and that's his that's his solution. He doesn't want the city council running anything, yeah. and I, I, I can certainly uh, understand that. Uh, well, I, th think? I think I think you have asked the pr most pressing question, David, when you said, "What does local control mean?" And just to clarify the record, because there is some false narrative out there that I did not sign the pledge. I did sign the pledge for local control, but what does that mean? It does not mean just simply that we have local negotiation but also that we have the control over f the forecast also of the revenue that's going to be needed. Right now, that is re re uh, deposited with the pension board. We also need control over that uh, for the forecasted cost. And this is important because the city's represented, the elected officials need to have some way of budgeting the cost of pension over time. So local control is not simply re giving us the power to make a decision, but also to control how we're going to pay for the pensions. I just want to just throw out, as you probably know, the 8.5% that the agencies did, the city didn't have any say-so on, is the highest rate of return for a municipal pension plan in the country. Yes. But what not it does sustainable. Is it, 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 but it, what it does it do is gives us false confidence that we're going to be able to catch this up. Uh, but if the real, if the reality were really shown, obviously we're in a greater hole than we. So hopefully, right Sylvester, now. if you're married, you will take well, but, that away but, from. But, but what people refuse to talk about, which is very important, you have 5,300 police officers in the city of Houston right now. You have fewer police officers today than what you had 10 years ago. Roughly 1,900 of them are eligible to retire right now. If you try to go in and use an axe to deal with this problem without dealing with comprehensive finance reform, we're not just going to have a finance issue. We're going to have a public safety issue. And the number one priority of any mayor of any major city is the safety and security of this citizenry. Well, that's but, but that's, that, I mean, that's and, that's, and that is a that's real, real argument. It's not false. It is very much real. Yeah, but, but, that, but that is exactly the reason why you don't change it for existing employees, only new employees. If right. we're only changing it for new employees on a go-forward basis, there's no reason for those folks that are getting ready to retire to be concerned about their retirement. And when we had the, the, the spike in retirements back in 2004, it was because at that time Mayor White was talking about changing the existing plans, and so they quit. It's an absolute legitimate concern, but not if you're just talking about going forward with new employees. Well, but if, you want, if, but if you're talking about financial stability, West Virginia, they shifted from a defined benefit. Oh, come on. Wait, let me, let me finish. No, wait, they, I mean, they shifted from a defined, ben uh, defined benefit to defined contribution, and the unfunded liability went dramatically up, and they reversed course. Seriously, Alaska, I mean, look, Alaska private, and Michigan. The entire private sector has gone to defined contribution, but, 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 the, but the paragon of financial acumen in the country, West Virginia, has figured this out when all Michigan, private industry Michigan and Alaska, that. private industry and the city of Houston are Harris two different County, things. Harris bills. County doesn't have you a defined cannot, benefit. You Harris cannot, County has a defined contribution plan. The, 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 Why do we Guys, well, I want to let Ben Hall get a word in here. Yeah, that's okay. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can fuss about those issues. The point is this. We have to have a, the ability to control our costs on pensions. 
we happen to be right when we say we have to go to defined contribution. We cannot continue to insure against market risk, which uh, defined benefits puts places us in. So we can move to defined contributions without dishonoring any of the past agreements that All we've right, made. While we're at it, Ben, I mean, I've got you there. Uh, the big, the big bugaboo in the room is Prop One Hero. To, uh, the Chronicle would be this week, uh, yesterday, because we're in, we're on Friday night. Uh, basically, the front page was not what David said. It was an ad for Prop One, uh, which, by the way, I consider to be the white flag of surrender. But mm -hmm. I want to know what your take is on Hero, and, and you have a different. Yeah. Why do you have a? You're, you're you're really out there on that. Well, let me not say, there being as a, as a former city attorney who has written anti-discrimination laws for the city of Houston, I actually don't have the luxury to be to play politics with this issue, and so I've actually read this ordinance, 36 pages. It has uh, such defects that it will allow precisely the risk that the opponents are suggesting. As the mayor of the city of Houston, I want to tell you the truth, and that is this is a dangerous ordinance as written. I don't want any discrimination against transgender individuals or anyone else, but that does not justify passing a bad law. And let me tell you, I'll give you an example. Just assume that in this ordinance, the lawyers had included that we would not discriminate against pedophiles. Nobody, I would hope, on this panel would ever say, let's pass the ordinance. Well, if there is a defect in the ordinance that endangers the public, it seems to me the leader of the city, the next leader of the city, should tell the truth and say, this ordinance is poorly written. It needs to fail at the ballot box this November. Let's try and improve it if that's the alternative. You have a different point of view, Mr. McDaniel. I do. I, I support Prop 1. Uh, I think it's good for the city. I, I look at this on you know many different angles, and what the city stands to lose is an estimated eight hundred million dollars in revenue in sporting events alone, and that's what hurts the small business. That's what hurts big business right here. Uh, discrimination in any form is bad for this city. We have uh, over two hundred cities across the nation have similar ordinances, including right here in Texas, El Paso, Dallas. Uh, Austin, San Antonio. I mean, we need to be a modern city and start acting like it. I guess uh, I would ask you, Mr. Sylvester, you're, you're in favor of it, but I want to ask you this question first. Seven months ago, before this ordinance passed, we didn't have an anti-discrimination ordinance, as so-called by the mayor, and we still had the Final Four and the Super Bowl and everything else, and now the Campaign Four is with these histrionics that all of a sudden the world's coming to an end if you vote no on this, I believe, defective ordinance. Uh, don't you think this is really out of bounds campaigning by the the pro Absolutely forces? Not, because discrimination in any form, especially when it's based on group dynamics, is wrong. Um, and the Greater Houston Partnership supports it, and they are concerned about the message that we are sending forth. The ordinance doesn't just cover one group; it covers fifteen different groups. It covers fifteen, and people. It, it, it is amazing to me. Well, people do not want to talk about the other 14 groups. Yeah, that, 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 that's what that, 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 that is basing to me. Uh, you, you, Bill, you said to the Chronicle that this was unnecessarily divisive, this ordinance. Uh, so my question to you and everyone else is, when has the struggle for civil rights been anything else other than uh, uncivil By the way, and you difficult? Have to accept his premise. The, well, question, well the, the abolitionists. Thank you. I've, the I've, abolitionists, I've made that objection in court before. The abolitionists Look, created. Here, here's, my, here's my problem. My frustration is the fact that we're talking about this. During the time the ordinance was in place, we had 11 complaints, five of which were ruled to be without merit. Okay? While we're talking here today, there would be more robberies, burglaries, and rapes committed in the city of Houston than the entire complaints filed under this ordinance. 600 rapes last year unsolved in the city. If we want to talk about a public safety issue, why aren't we talking about the 600 rape victims that got no justice? Lisa Falkenberg had a great column about this earlier this week. Why aren't we talking about the job we're not doing there? Why aren't we talking about the 20 or 30,000 burglars and robberies that were not investigated in the city last year? That to me seems to be like a bigger problem that we ought to really be addressing than maybe six complaints over a seven, nine month but period or something. is always important. I, but even, rapes even, not, but even burglaries not, build, even, robberies are not, even give me a break. Bill, even throughout our history, there have been people who did not want to talk about discrimination and wanted to talk about everything else. So when, and you are the, falling right the, in that pattern. the case for discrimination? Let, 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 where did it occur? We have let, six let, alleged complaints. There were three black guys who were, denied, who were denied entrance to a club a few yeah, weeks ago. Gary, let me clarify some information because it seems to me we have politics based on headlines. The fact of the matter is the city of Houston, as of 2012, has an anti-discrimination law on the books. In fact, 13 of the 15 categories that these candidates are now suggesting 
don't exist under uh, pr being protected are in fact protected. The only thing the 2012 law did not cover is genetic information and familial status. <coughs> but all of these others, gender identity, sexual orientation, that's already the law in the city of Houston. This mm -hmm. ordinance, the 2014 ordinance, is too poorly written, too dangerous, it needs to be voted down. Mm -hmm. okay. Marty? Listen, this is an issue, and I, I haven't heard any uh, of my opponents to discuss this. We're, we're estimated at $800 million in loss of revenue to this city. That's Who is the next mayor? No, though. Kenny Friedman testified about this. Oh, at, you know, at, that's at scary tactics. Well, you know I don't believe it. Oh, so what about the ad on television? That's right. And what about the next mayor being able to go to those businesses and say, I'm sorry, we, you know, you're going to have to be out of business because we don't have you. I want to know the number of transgender people there are that we're worried about. Thank you, Laurie. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, you can continue the conversation online with Houston Public Media's digital series, Political Perspectives, featuring Jay Iyer and Brandon Roddinghouse. Starting at 8 p.m., log on to HoustonPublicMedia.org slash perspectives. And remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7.30 p.m. here on TV8 and again Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you have to say about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org or on Facebook, and don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.